Let us pray. Oh, Jesus of mystery, we don't always, or ever, really understand your words and deeds in Scripture. In you, we see a brother who inspires us to love those close to us, yet who calls us to greater commitments and allegiances. Your ministry calls disciples to find a new kind of security in homelessness. A new kind of family outside blood kin. As we hear your words once again, increase our understanding so that we might follow you more nearly. Amen. Well, uh, so these past few weeks, uh, Terry and I have been presenting Bible stories from both Testaments and trying to suss out why this ancient and pre-modern collection of writings matters to us today. I thought I'd turn it around uh, just for this long weekend Sunday and uh, ask about, uh, talk about anyway, why it matters first. And then we'll get to the story later. You know, just to keep us on our frozen toes here. Um, there's some good news in why it matters to understand these uh, stories from so long ago. But first, let me line out a bit of bad news. As if you need more uh, in a world that's infected by a fast-spreading virus and toxic authoritarianism. As if you need more bad news. Um, the bad news is about the United Church of Canada, our denomination. When the United Church was founded by an act of parliament back in 1925, it immediately became the largest Protestant denomination and the second largest religious denomination in Canada, second only to the Roman Catholic Church. But for the past 40 years or so, the United Church has closed more than one pastoral charge per week. More than 52 a year in the past 42, 40 years. And over the past 60 years, the church has lost almost 90% of its membership. In 1959, the United Church gathered one million or more people every Sunday in local churches from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island. In 2017, though, it was about 125,000 that gathered every Sunday in churches from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island, but that's an 87% decrease. Over those same 60 years, though, the Canadian population has doubled. And, of course, uh, you don't need anybody to remind you, uh, the United Church is aging. The calculation is that the average age of the 10, 000, 100,000 people who will come to the United Church on any of the Sundays this month, February 2020, will be over 70. The average age is over 70. And that that ever age, the average age of the one million or so people who came to a United Church service on any of the Sundays in February 1960 was near 40. Now, who here went to church in February of 1960? Anybody? Oh, oh all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, right. Uh, so, so, did, so did I. Um, uh, because, not because my parents made me go but because I loved hanging out with my uh, fellow grade one students and learning things that I didn't learn in my weekday school. And uh, the kids that were in that grade one class in Sunday school were not generally the ones I saw in school because I grew up in a very Roman Catholic neighborhood and uh, the little uh, United Church of Christ there was, uh, was quite tiny. And yet we had hordes and hordes of kids in 1960. 
I mean, I can even remember the name of the Sunday school teacher from that year. But now, well, uh, you know, as local congregations carry on and go about their work and the reduced courts of the church go about their work with diligence and optimism, no one seems to be arguing that this uh, drastic decline in aging will moderate this year or next year or any year. And not just the United Church of Canada, but all mainline denominations here in this country and in the United States and in Australia and New Zealand and the mother countries of those denominations in Western Europe, we're called old line denominations. No longer mainline, we're now old line churches because of those significant losses. Big established churches have lost the status in society that they had since the settling of North America back in the late 18th century. The, uh, <laughs> speaking of going back in time here, the comedian Flip Wilson. Anybody remember him? Flip Wilson? Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> then this will work. <laughs> he was the guy that said, the devil made me do it, right? Funny guy. Um, on TV, I don't know, in the 60s. Well, he had a stock reply to anybody who ever asked him about his religious affiliation. He said, I'm a Jehovah's bystander. <laughs> and he'd say that proudly. I'm a Jehovah's bystander. They asked me to become a Jehovah's witness, but I didn't want to get involved. <laughs> I, you know, I laughed when I first heard that, but uh, it turns out that now, Flip Wilson's religion is the biggest denomination of all. Um, we might remember, all of us that were in a church in February of 1960, we might remember with some nostalgia a time when attending and belonging to a mainline church, whether Protestant or Catholic, was a given. Everybody went to church. Everybody. Oh, sure, in our neighborhood there was, there was some Jewish folks, you know, but they went, to, they went to their synagogue on Saturday. We all knew where it was. We all went to the bar mitzvahs and the bat mitzvahs. I mean, it was easy to go to church back then um, because there was no shopping on Sunday morning. There were no sports events for kids. There were no movies. There was no engaging uh, television or anything else on Sunday morning. Working people had Saturdays and some evenings off from work. Remember those days? Leaving them somewhat refreshed on Sunday morning. And church was the only game in town. So that's what you did. But those days are long gone. Long, long gone. And if you build a new mainline denominational church these days, no one will come. As opposed to building a church in, say, 1957, like this one was. And people came. <sighs> But wait, wait a minute. Maybe this isn't such bad news after all. Maybe this isn't such bad news after all. If you think about it, church attendance isn't a very good way to measure actual spiritual engagement. <coughs> I think of it this way. It's not a good way to, ma mass to measure actual spiritual engagement in the same way attendance at the Grey Cup football game is a poor indicator of how many of those people in the seats ever played football. It's the same thing. The late theologian Marcus Borg had a very healthy view about this decline in attendance. In his 2006 book entitled simply Jesus, Borg looked at the decline in mainline churches over the past 40 years and he wrote this. The good news is in this decline is that very soon the only people left in mainline congregations will be the ones that are there for intentional rather than conventional reasons. This creates the possibility for the church once again to become an alternative community rather than a conventional community, living into a deepening relationship with the Lord 
rather than the lords of culture. This is exciting. This is exciting. Yeah, well, if it's not exciting as you sit here, you know, exactly this morning, it is hopeful and just a bit gratifying, I think. I feel as though some hope was felt at our annual general meeting right here three weeks ago. Remember that? We were there for intentional purposes, not conventional purposes, and joy was expressed at the fact that we, as a community of faith, are still growing but slowly to be sure, but thriving. Though our knees may hurt and our backs twinge from time to time. I take that remark personally. <laughs> and there have been sad losses of, of well-loved members over these past few years. But we are a congregation of maturity and wisdom and still youthful enthusiasm with some creative new ways of presenting and apprehending and living out the teachings of Jesus still to come. There's still new ways of thinking about this. I mean, we are here for intentional rather than conventional purposes. Nobody joins a church, at least a church like ours, to be seen as a church goer or to make business contacts anymore if anyone ever did. But back in the 50s and 60s, in order to make decent business contacts, in order to get certain positions, you had to be a member of a church. Those days are long gone. And hallelujah. Joining a church can even be a social or political hindrance rather than an asset. A fact that would have made Jesus, I think, very, very pleased. <laughs> Joining Jesus' band was a dangerous and risky thing to do 1980-some years ago. Intention, not convention, was called upon at every step back then. And so it is once again. Conventional church is an aberration. Intentional church is what it always has been and always should be. Now, let's get to the story. Um, listen to this from the latter chapter of, latter part of chapter one of John's gospel. And when Marion says the name John here, it's referring to John the Baptist in this story. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed one. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Well, there is a lot of historical, geographical, and theological conflation and chaos in, in that particular passage. You can see John trying to fit all the titles. John, written much later after the other three, trying to fit all of the traditions that have already been uh, established among, among followers of Jesus in those few passages. It's, it's a kind of 
uh, over, overweighted there. But we can ignore all that for now. But I love how Jesus and a new member of his little congregation both see, both say, come and see. Come and see. That's a phrase that we might well use, and there's no doubt that many of us already have. Come and see is what Jesus is teaching. Ask your friends and acquaintances to come and see if anything good can come out of an old mainline denominational church. Come and see. Come and see an intentional rather than a conventional church. Now here's the thing. Uh, We look rather conventional. Let's face it. We look very traditional. We sit in these rows of chairs that we try to make look like pews, even though they're slightly more comfortable. And we sing old-fashioned hymns, even if they do have uh, gender-inclusive, non-hierarchical, non-violent lyrics. You know, and, and, we, and we've got a choir dressed in robes in a choir loft. And some of them, some of them have canes. <laughs> yeah, we're conventional. And, uh, and we're aging. And uh, everyone sits and listens to, uh, to preachers, one of whom is young and hip, the other who is old and crotchety. And um, wearing robes, that's pretty medieval. That's pretty old-fashioned. That's pretty, that's pretty conventional. But you have to be intentional to be an active part of this church. It's not easy or convenient. We have more questions than answers. We teach new ways of seeing rather than a series of doctrinal tenets to be believed. Take a look at your bulletin there uh, again on page one in the gray box. These are uh, quotes by Henry David Thoreau, the philosopher of uh, New England back in the early part of the uh, 19th century. He said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Three weeks ago, we adopted a budget that is balanced on the promise that new people will continue to come and see, based not on our rejuvenated website or other publicity that we're working on, but on all of us intentionally inviting people here for Sunday morning, for our Monday night classes, for our special seasonal services, for chair yoga, for healing or meditation in our quiet room, for our youth and Sunday school ministries, for our community outreach, for our worldwide outreach, for our music services and our concerts. Come and see. As the other Thoreau quote there in the box on page one puts it, never look back unless you're planning to go that way. Our 2020 budget that we passed three weeks ago doesn't look back because we aren't going that way, are we? We aren't going that way. For all of us, flawed as we are, whether or not others will see the teachings of Jesus act out in, acted out in us, all of us will depend not on the conventions we follow, but rather on the life into which our intentions take us. We have a message and a mission that is neither conventional nor popular, but intentionally tries to see through the eyes of Jesus, the wisdom teacher who has dipped us in the sacred breath. Just as good a translation as baptized in the Holy Spirit, dipped in the sacred breath. That's who we are, no matter how powerful our compression socks are, (laughs) no matter what kind of brace we're wearing on our right knee. We are intentional followers of Jesus. Before we sing, um, let us pray.
so one being who spoke your word so powerfully through holy wisdom, through the person of Jesus. Grant this, this congregation the power to see as you see, to feel as you feel, to live in your realm as Jesus did. And let us together, yachad, let us together be an instrument of holy discontent whenever the world is shoddy or unjust or calloused against your mercy. May we be a haven for the lonely, a voice for the oppressed, and an intentional servant at all times of both your truth and your promises. In the name of Jesus, who points directly at you, we pray. Amen.